Okay, we are here tonight for a workshop. We will note that Councillor Beam is missing with an excused absence tonight. And number one on the agenda will be a briefing on the opioid epidemic or addiction issues. Ed? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we do have someone here tonight to make a presentation, Catherine Ryder, who's been working with a group of local stakeholders to uh, pull together some information and some approaches toward the opioid problem. And I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. She has a PowerPoint to walk you through. Good evening. My name is Katherine Ryder, and I currently serve as the Executive Director for Tri-County Mental Health Services, and I am also the project lead for this specific grant project that I will be reviewing with you this evening. And you will note that the name of our grant project is called Community Unity in Bold Print Recovery because we believe that it takes a community working together to address such a complex issue. So when we first received our grant dollars, we determined that the most important thing to do was to create a purpose statement for the work that lay at hand. And so working together as a collaborative with the voice of patients as part of this discussion, this is the statement that we arrived at. And it's to create a community response and safe pathway to recovery that provides full access, reduces stigma, and encourages the possibility of successful overall well-being and participation. So what do we know about opiates? We know that there have been an estimated 60,000 deaths from opiate overdose in America in 2016. And we know that this translates to more than car crashes, which were 40,000, or gun deaths, which were 10,000. In the state of Maine, you can see the trajectory, which is not a pretty picture, from 1997 to 2016, where we topped out at 378 overdose deaths. Also of significant importance is the number of drug-affected babies that have been born in our state. And again, you can see the trajectory has been on a steady climb, although I believe the last data point brought that down just a small amount. So we are making some small gains. So let me introduce you to our team. When we put this grant forward, we believed that it was critically important for this to be a community-wide response, not just the responsibility of a hospital and a behavioral health care system, but much more importantly, that we look at all of the social determinants that were critical to the arriving at of excellent outcomes. And so our partners include Tri-County Mental Health, and as I mentioned, we are project lead for this particular initiative, and we bring to the um, collaborative the community mental health and substance use disorder treatment services. St. Mary's Regional Medical Center serves as our clinical lead in terms of Dr. Um, Med Kelly, those of you who may know him from St. Mary's, is a waiver trained in um, Suboxone and is also taking the lead on developing the protocols for clinical treatment for this particular grant project. Both Lewiston PD and Auburn PD are represented at the table. Community Concepts, which is our CAP agency, and they bring resources that include housing, economic development, and social services. United Ambulance is at the table, and we are looking at their community paramedicine program specifically. Bates College, and we have a significant number of students that are actively engaged in this project. I think we have five different project teams right now. Healthy Androscoggin for planning, community <coughs> action, education, and advocacy. Androscoggin County Jail, Central Maine Healthcare, um, who are also providing MAT services through their outpatient and inpatient services. The Maine Alliance for Addiction Recovery, which is our statewide recovery community organization representing the voice of those individuals who are in recovery. Androscoggin Home Care and Hospice, and Androscoggin County Sheriff. So you can see it's a fairly expansive group of stakeholders, all who are deeply invested, who attend our monthly stakeholder committee meetings, and who bring the authority of the resources from their organizations to the table. 
So what are our goals in this project? To increase access to treatment for opiate addiction. So one of the things that we learned early was that we had a very limited number of prescribers for medication-assisted treatment, and so one of our key goals was to expand access by training new prescribers to be able to serve <coughs> individuals in our community. To create a better flow between all aspects of treatment, so we know that coordination of care is critical for such a complex population of individuals and making sure that we had a thread that wove itself through all of our services and provided um, a solid safety net for those individuals we were serving was critical. No wrong door, so no matter where we come into contact with someone, whether it's law enforcement on the streets, in the hospital, in the emergency department, at one of our community settings, we want to be able to say, come on in. Sharing best practice across the systems will be critical, so we're trying to establish consistent protocols so that no matter where someone uh, arrives um, requesting treatment, the protocols will be similar and that we will have shared expectations. Support recovery with wraparound supports, meaning that we're going to be looking at opportunities for low barrier housing, meaningful employment, education, and workforce training, as well as all the other social determinants like food security, and making sure that folks are well connected to recovery capital. Better coordination of care. We know that we can always do a better job of tying up the loose ends. Reducing stigma, which will be one of the most critical goals in this particular initiative because the stigma that comes with this particular disorder is significant and often impacts individuals' ability to access the care they need. And our ultimate goal is to restore hope to those individuals that are seeking recovery. So what's our plan? We have worked closely for the past year with a leading healthcare attorney who is both stateside and nationally recognized for his work in healthcare law, and he has developed what we are referring to as a universal release, which will allow all stakeholders to work together openly and fluidly so that we can share information around particular individuals that will be enrolled in the initiative. So if you can imagine someone turns up at any one of our entities and we ask them if they would be interested in participating in this initiative. They say yes, they sign on the dotted line, and we review with them the risks and benefits of that. But essentially what it means is that we can share information, excuse me, across the different organizations to better build a comprehensive plan of recovery for each specific individual. The MAT, Medication Assisted Treatment, or buprenorphine training, and this is specific to Suboxone. So there are other types of MAT, methadone, subutex. We have focused specifically on <coughs> Suboxone, although we are inviting other providers of MAT to the table as part of the discussion. And so our clinical subcommittee includes individuals who, uh, organizations rather, who also provide methadone treatment. <coughs> and we just recently hosted at St. Mary's Regional Medical Center a training for prescribers and Substance Abuse Mental Health Services of America provided that training for us. They came to Lewiston and we had eight prescribers who sat in that day. We were hoping for a larger number. We shot for a ceiling of 30 and we ended up with eight, but that's eight <coughs> individuals who will have 30 slots available for patients in the first year and 100 thereafter. So it's still an increase, and our goal would be to have Dr. Kelly, who is part of that training, who can now co-facilitate a second training and then become a trainer himself, available within our community to continue trainings over the years to come. We're looking at creating community resources, some of which are already here to be enhanced and others which are not here yet and which we hope will be able to be developed within our communities. And we are currently doing um, a, a mapping, if you will, of available resources across Androscoggin County. And one of our Bates students will be doing a geo-mapping project so that they will be able to, um, through an IT platform, be able to identify where is housing, where is food, where is employment opportunities, where is MAT treatment, and where are the other resources that someone might need. So if we can translate that onto a cell phone application, Individuals who may be homeless but have a cell phone will be able to access those resources in real time while they are in the community. Recovery community. This is individuals with lived experience 
from opiate use disorder or other substance use disorders, and they are now in a full state of recovery and ready to assist other folks to begin their journey. And so we have been actively interviewing and inviting folks to join that subcommittee to share their experience. They will be our best teachers. They will help us to understand language that is meaningful and accessible to the people that we are trying to outreach and they will be vetting documents that we develop in ensuring that we are moving the needle in the right direction. We currently have a committee of six. We're hoping to grow that over time, but I think it's a fine start and we're looking forward to having them be front and center and using their voice to help move the project forward. Law enforcement has been vital and they have been passionate advocates coming to the table every month and sharing both the challenges that they are faced with as well as the opportunities they hope will come as a result of this grant. And interestingly, when we did our first SWAT, which is the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats as we began our, our process, they were not able to identify any strengths at that time in the community around this particular issue. And I think they were feeling fairly hopeless about what we were doing in the broader community. And as a result of attending these meetings and seeing that there is some movement forward in spite of the fact that it will take us some time to get to where we want to be, they now have filled out the strengths box and it's fairly robust. So I'm delighted to see that and I'm delighted to be working with them. They've been wonderful partners. And so, in closing, we believe that with community recovery is possible and that if we continue this work, and just so um, I probably should have told you up front that this is a Maine Health Access Foundation grant. It is a planning grant and there are four potential years of funding. The first year was $50,000. We are soon to enter the second year, which would be um, another round of $50,000. Third and fourth year, will be upwards of $100,000 each, and we are intending to spread the project from Androscoggin County to Oxford and Franklin. We will have a pilot initiative, um, probably late summer, early fall, kicking off the planning into an actual service delivery. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions from Council Lacey? Thank you, Catherine, for your work and the work of the committee. You just answered my question about who the grant tour is. Um, also wondered what's the interface with the Lewis and Auburn uh, Health uh, Committee, the Public Health Public Committee? Public Health? Yeah. Well, some of the folks that are there are also part of our steering committee. So Corey Brown and Erin Gay uh, share seats on the steering committee. I recently presented to the Public Health uh, Committee and answered some of their questions as well. We hope to stay connected through the course of the grant period. So the committee currently has six people that ongoing, as well as all of the organizations that you mentioned as a team? The steering committee is about 14 strong. Okay. 14 individuals representing 12 organizations. And then we have five subcommittees oh, that include individuals that are beyond the steering committee. So we've invited other community members that have expertise in this area or have an investment in this area to come and sit on those subcommittees. Growing the uh, steering committee much beyond 14 makes it just a bit unwieldy. And finally, um, Question on uh, Gray Street or mm -hmm. Grace Recovery Services. Have they been part of this process at all with you We guys? outreached them fairly recently to ask them if they would table with us at the training we just did for the prescribers. And I don't know if they came or not, to be perfectly honest with you. I came in the morning and then had to go to Augusta. Because I think they're, it, my, my uh, experience is that they're doing great work. And Absolutely. And they may just be too busy too, so because it is a, an issue. But I would suggest outreaching with them again as well. And but uh, again, thank you for your work, and it's really, really important issue. So. I agree. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I would just follow up on what Councillor License said in terms of thanking you for your work. We're traveling a lot of public health circles together, and I know what a big undertaking this is. Um, something else I was going to follow up with. I can't remember, so thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All set. Okay. I will take some public comment at this time if anyone would. Hi, my name is Ronnie Parity. I'm the chair of the Public Health Committee for the City of Lewiston, and I'm here to uh, Public Health Committee is supporting 
uh, Catherine's committee's work, and she has come to us and let us know what's going on. Also, we've had uh, the police department come and uh, give us a report too. So we're keeping in communication and supporting this effort by uh, the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor, just real quickly, I was gonna mention that also included in your packet is some information from the police department going back historically to uh, record overdoses that we're aware of in the community. In 2013, there were 12 overdoses, uh, one of which resulted in a death. In 2014, there were 19 overdoses, two resulted in a death. 2015, 41 overdoses with seven deaths. 2016, 100 overdoses with 11 deaths. 2017, 90 overdoses with 11 deaths. And of course, we're just starting the new year, so we only have a couple months worth of data or one month's worth of data. Uh, in January, there were nine overdoses uh, and two deaths. We also got some information from United Ambulance. Um, last year, they administered Narcan 70 times. So I don't know how much overlap there is between what the police report and what they report. Um, but that gives you some idea of what's been happening. Obviously, the situation grew quickly. Uh, it appears to some extent like the rapid growth has leveled off. But uh, we're still, I think, early to, to make that judgment. <clears throat> Are all these uh, deaths related to the overdose uh, individuals that live in the Lewiston area, or uh, are some of those the, outside? The information you know? from the police department are calls in Lewiston, same with United Ambulance. I don't know if we have residency information, but I would assume most of those folks would be residents? Yeah, I, I didn't compile a residency information. I can tell you some of the deaths have been people who don't live in Lewiston, but unfortunately have come to Lewiston to purchase um, the drugs the that they've used and then they do die. Right. Um, but all those uh, numbers that I gave you were, were calls that my, my police officers responded to here in Lewiston. In, in your uh, studies um, on these calls and everything, have you done uh, anything with regards as to uh, different age groups, nationalities, uh, we, we have, we, No, we haven't done that. I mean, I, so you get to a group of people will say, I don't know, between 25 and 35. You know, it's most often that it happens. I can tell you that the age spectrum would, is very surprising that there's people in their 20s and people in their 50s. Yeah. Um, we've had people in their 60s overdose and not die, so it's a, the substance abuse issue is through all nationalities and all age groups. It's not just the 20 somethings. It's right. unfortunately, it's throughout our society. That's okay. right. Thank you. So I remembered what I was going to say. Um, so none of us here are experts on this, um, and you are. So I, I just think it's important that we're getting sort of regular updates from you. I think we're going to be reliant on you to sort of really guide us policy wise. Happy to do that. Great. That was my point, too. Um, I think this is, you know, worthy of, of some policy development, both at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, I think, obviously, we're the, the that avenue here in Lewiston, and I think that uh, I would like to see some policy recommendations if there's something we can do as a, a municipality uh, and as a city council. Um, I think that would, that would be important, and I think I'd like to see some better communication back and forth and maybe even some participation in some of your committees from some of interested people here. So um, again, I think policy development is, is critically important here uh, and it, it, I think you guys are doing the groundwork that could help develop that policy, um, but uh, I'd, I'd like to see it, it go further as well. So. May I respond? Sure. We actually have some key policy issues that we would like to present to you fairly soon, mm -hmm. um, keeping in mind that this first year has really been assessment and planning and identifying mm -hmm. where the gaps to what is needed are. And in fact, there will be some requests for consideration of housing first initiatives Great. as well as 
um, employment for individuals who have felony charges, which is a significant barrier. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> and now we will move on to Bates Mill number five. Let me get the PowerPoint loaded up here. First of all, thanks for this opportunity. I've got uh, Tom Platts, who I think is well known, and Gabby Russell, who uh, has been engaged with this for a long time as well. She now works with Tom uh, on a broad array of things. This is a, a project that's really been uh, kind of 25 years in the making. Uh, I had a 10-page memo that uh, got into a lot of details. I'm not going to get anywhere close to that, but I'll try to hit the high points. Uh, we know this is a property, the Bates Mill Complex in general. We took over in 1992 for uh, Bates Manufacturing not paying their tax bill or paying their steam payments. It was a 1.2 million square foot building uh, that was really that proverbial white elephant in the heart of downtown, and the community really wrestled. Do we take this thing on? Do we tear it down? Do we just leave it? What do we do? And uh, that debate played out long and hard. It was. Uh, I was not in town at the time, so I was not there. I'm sure Tom was, and as I was working on this PowerPoint, I was sifting through. I've been with the city since 2000. I had some photos, and Tom was about my age uh, in one of those photos when we sold the Bates Mills. It was, you, you look great. So, <laughs> um, you know, when we took this on, there were 5,000 employees working there. Excuse me, before we took this on, there were 5,000 employees at the peak. There were less than 100 people working there. And really, I think the community wrestled with the Bates Mill. It's there. It was the heart of the community. It was the lifeblood around which the city grew. Um, it was really a reminder as we see it going derelict. Is this, is this uh, what we're going to live with, or are we going to do something about it? Community wrestled with it, did decide to move forward. Uh, there were two public referendums in the late 90s, both of which uh, were saying, yes, we should go forward with this. Uh, earlier than that, the Lewiston Millery Development Corporation had been founded. Uh, that was a group of citizens as well as the public works director, the economic development director at the time, the uh, city administrator, and a whole group of citizens, and the finance director. Uh, and uh, Tom was on the committee as well. But really, how do we move this forward? Actually, you weren't on LMRC. Not in the beginning. Not, not in the but, beginning. But within a year, I think. Yeah, I was going to say in 94, it was, they really realized we do not have the private sector development expertise. We need it. And uh, Tom came on and was, was, uh, was a key partner through that. Um, one thing I want to say, I, I think people tend to forget we look at Bates Mill and often we will hear people saying, yeah, God, Bates Mill just, you know, it's just so far gone. Bates Mill 5, it looks terrible. I did want to... Uh, Share some of the old images as I was sifting through these documents. This is uh, mill number three. TD Bank is the uh, tenant in this. This is a 180,000 square foot building. Uh, but when I, in 2000, that's what it looked like. That's what the side of mill number three looked like at the time. Um, I often say, hey, look, I, I can remember when these things didn't look so good. They're gorgeous now. People forget. This was, uh, you know, early 2000s, and unfortunately, I don't have a, a side shot that you can see that, uh, you know, the building has really been transformed. This mill was, uh, TD Bank was the tenant. Uh, they did it in three phases. It took about six years, but it's 180,000 square feet that they filled incrementally over time. Uh, this is standing in Mill 3, shooting back across the courtyard. You can see off the right side of this photo that uh, they're just starting construction on the Chestnut Street garage. you got the trailers. And this is that sort of big wide open area. We're really looking into what is today Da Vinci's Courtyard. And um, 
I'm going to go back. That was shot from the other side of it. This is what it looked like when it was completed. So you know, you went from a dirt lot, a vacant uh, mill that was derelict, buildings have been torn down, and really this project has, has absolutely been uh, transformed. The uh, city sold, uh, came to terms with Tom Platts in 2004. We uh, sold the mills that all except for the steam plant and Bates Mill Number Five. Uh, the agreement basically had the city doing public infrastructure, making some improvements um, that were agreed to at the time. That um, some of it was on our dime, some of it was on Tom's dime. One of the big issues was dealing with the brownfields. You really can't bank these projects unless they're clean. We already had the ownership. We had the environmental liabilities. That was part of the terms that we would clean them up. Uh, we've used federal dollars to help make that happen. Um, and uh, in, in addition to the brownfields and some of the public infrastructures, the other big project was doing the parking agreements, either surface parking or decked parking. Uh, there has been, at this point, 490,000 square feet out of the 1.2 million square feet. Uh, those, the Bates complex has been redeveloped. Uh, the 490,000, if you do not include Bates Mill number five, it's about 72% of the way to being done. The real and personal property uh, that uh, went from, you know, something we tax acquired 20 years later, it has an assessed valuation of 30, almost $38 million. The taxes it generates annually is 921,000, and uh, we were comparing notes today. I, I know my memo had said, uh, 1,200 people work there. Talking to Alan Turgeon, talking with Tom earlier today, uh, we're very comfortable that there are about 1,500 people that are either working or living in that complex. You've got a 48 unit. Um, the lofts at Bates Mill is there, and so you know, about 100, 100 people or so probably are there. At this point, we find ourselves at a crossroad again, uh, similar to where we were back in 92. Um, Bates 5 uh, is the one big building that was left back in 2008. The city created the Bates 5 Task Force. It was a kind of an all-star group of citizens, including uh, Jonathan Labonte and Mike Carey and uh, Rachel DeGrosier, um, uh, among others. It, it was a great group. They really dug in, spent about a year coming up with, how do, we, how do we take this on? How do we make this a viable, either what should we do with it? What's a viable reuse strategy? After looking at everything from retail to housing to uh, just a whole host of things, it was either a convention center, a casino, or put a request for proposal on the streets if neither of those get any water. And if the request for proposal doesn't generate anything, let's do a demolition. The cost of doing a convention center, forget about the $38 million in debt, it was still going to be about a quarter million after five years of stabilization with the sort of uh, revenues you would see coming in. So the convention center really was not a viable reuse strategy. Uh, the casino, uh, we, I was not in favor of it. Um, the council at the time was not either, but uh, as we know, there was a private sector that got a uh, option on the mill and uh, nice thing about the casinos that would be done by the private sector uh, there would have been very little public investment in it but it was really sort of a step back I thought and uh, would have helped redefine the city back to some of the the old days bottom line is the state did not support it so the casino option really was not viable uh, we did put a request for proposals out it was right in 2008 we got one proposal back by a well-known uh, main base developer who's done other projects of this scale. And he, uh, before we really got down to negotiating uh, the details of it, it was 2008, the economy was souring. He stepped back and said, Link, in good, good conscience, I cannot keep this in. I'm doing my best just to keep my other projects afloat. So he stepped back. Um, we did the Riverfront Island Master Plan. And if any of you are engaged in that, you can remember there was great debate as to uh, what we should do with 77 acres in the heart of downtown, with Bates Mill being right in the thick of that, as well as other mills, I would say that about 65 to 70 percent of our time looking at those 70 acre, 770, 77 acres were focused on what do we do with the four acres that Bates Mill stands. There were uh, two camps. Uh, one, which was well represented by Gabby, was this is a historic gem, and uh, it, it's got great architecture, great bones, 
it's the fabric of our community, it needs to stay. And then there is another camp who says it is a butt ugly building, which is where our ancestors uh, were enslaved. And it's just a reminder of bad times. Uh, those two camps played out. Ultimately, the Roof Front Island Master Plan recommended, reluctantly, to tear it down. Just thinking the building really, uh, the structure of it was such where it cannot easily be redeveloped uh, and the cost of doing so would not be there. It was not amenable to housing. Uh, Gabby and a group called Grow LA said, we don't really agree with that. Let's see what we can do to generate interest. They came to the city, asked uh, for some time before demolition could be done to uh, really come up with a reuse strategy. They put a lot of energy into it, uh, got a lot of interest and uh, got enough interest. The uh, Sun Journal covered it. Uh, we had the public engaged in it. All sorts of ideas were coming forth. Uh, enough so that, that Tom Platts uh, took notice. He had the YMCA who was committed to it. CMMFC was committed to it. So right out of the gate, we had about 150,000 square feet of tenants. As we were talking about a, uh, a joint development agreement, we were talking about having 200,000 square feet would be what would be the trigger to move forward with it. And um, as we all know at this point, the uh, CMMC pulled back. The YMCA is still very much engaged in it. Um, Tom has been working on this. He's got $700,000 of, of his own money as well as uh, some of the partners doing feasibility studies as well as engineering studies and architectural efforts. Um, so we find ourselves at this point after several renewals on an option uh, with the option expiring at the end of this month. Uh, let me go to the next slide here. This is a, a shot of the downtown. Um, the green is uh, Bates Mill, 360,000 square feet. Um, the pink is the rest of the Bates Mill complex. That's about 680,000. And what is done in yellow uh, is really the heart of downtown from uh, Chestnut Street all the way to Main Street. And just to put it in scale, all of those buildings uh, in their entirety, all of them are not fully occupied, but that represents about 675,000 square feet. So uh, really what Tom has done with the rest of the Bates Mill complex is saying over the course of 20 years, I'm gonna, he has you know, gone a large measure, 72% of the way <coughs> to filling the downtown. Uh, we're now looking at Bates Mill number five, 360,000 square feet. I will say sort of the concept as we had uh, first proposed it with 200,000 square feet, we thought we were three quarters of the way there with uh, two tenants who were committed uh, doing feasibility studies with their boards of directors took uh, at, at um, taking board action saying we're committed to this one move forward there was a change of leadership at CMMC that took some of the wind out of the sails but Tim Tom's continued to work it um, so at this point we're looking at what's what's next how do we how do we move this forward can we move this forward uh, Tom remains committed we do have uh, A fair amount of work that needs to be done both on the city side before a week ago forward. There's a brownfield mitigation as part of this. We've got about $1.17 million worth of cleanup that would need to occur for this to go forward. Um, regardless of whether the building is demolished or remains standing, there's about $245,000 worth of work that needs to be done there. We need to own it when that work happens. Uh, we've applied, applied for a $200,000 Brownfield grant, and uh, we should be hearing from that in the spring. Uh, but it's going to take some time to do that. Uh, as far as continuing the commitment to this, it's going to take us at least a year or more. Tom continues to have uh, activity. And Tom, if, do you want to chat with? Sure. Um, just, um, Obviously, lots of things have happened since we started this. Uh, probably the key was CMMC pulling out. Um, but since then, we've had interest from other parties. Uh, we're in discussions with the University of Maine, and they're very positive discussions. Uh, I, I won't say I'm confident it's going to happen, but I'm um, feeling pretty positive that it's going to move forward. Uh, as you know, that stuff takes a lot of time. Um, and so you know that 
Other things are also happening at the mill. I mean, we're currently in discussion with three different tenants for over 120,000 square feet, which would fill mill uh, one and two, would come close to filling those. We'd have a little bit of space left. Uh, what we find happening, someone might ask, why don't those people just go into mill five? People come to you and they want to be in in five months. They want to be in in four months. Uh, um, and mill five, that's just not going to happen in four or five months. Um, that's more likely 24 months, 30 months, as, as Link said, to, for the city to get done with their work and for us to get done with our work. Um, from our point of view, we're going to continue filling the mill that we're working on now, as well as trying to find more tenants for mill five. Um, I don't see any real need to tear down any of the mills right now. I mean, I don't see what it would accomplish. Uh, from our point of view, we're renovating these mills at between $180 and $200 a square foot. We're building new buildings at $250 a square foot. So for me, that's a no-brainer. I mean, I'd rather spend $180 or $200 a square foot to create new space. On top of that, mill number five is still offering, fortunately, from the last uh, Congress and Senate, 20% um, federal tax credits, plus up to $10 million from the state of Maine as if you phase both of their tax credits in. So that's going to lower that cost down into the $140 a square foot, which you can't touch with new construction. So it really puts Lewiston in a good position to be able to attract new businesses to come here. Um, but as you all know, it's not a quick thing. I've been working on this mill for a long time. Uh, a year ago, we attracted a company from San Francisco who's now moved in. I think they're up to 140, 145 employees, starting salaries well over $40,000 a year, and they're thriving. Uh, we have one of our tenants who was a, a new company f almost five years ago whose lease is coming up and wants to talk about expanding. So things are happening in the mill. It's still very desirable for businesses to come into space like this. Um, I'm actually showing more space in the mill, I think, uh, on Friday and on next Monday. So we're constantly getting people interested. It just takes a long time to put these projects together. I mean, my, my advice would be, unless you have something better going there, I mean, and I don't think tearing it down can be said to be economically better. I mean, tearing it down and you have a project ready to go, I just think it would be wise to wait and, and, and let us keep working on it. I mean, I'd be the first to say, if any of you came to me in two years, look, we've got this company out of New York, wants to come up here, want the building gone, they're going to build a 350,000 square foot office complex. I'd say, let's do it. Let's go for it. I mean, I'm, I'm not for trying to hold up any kind of progress. <coughs> uh, we really want what's best for this area. And I think at this point, what's best is let's keep trying to take a shot at this and make it work. Um, I think it's attractive. I think the numbers you can put it together for are more attractive than anywhere else in the state. Um, I think elsewhere in Lewiston, we have new housing going up, with lots of great things happening, you know, restaurants coming into town, younger people moving up here because it's a lot more for affordable than Portland. I think now's the time to pay attention to it and to keep driving forward with this project. And any questions, I'm happy to answer. No questions. No questions. No. So no, no questions, but um, a statement. Uh, I, I fully support keeping the mill up. Um, you know, being here the last time with the planning board, going over the numbers of tearing it down, reinforcing the canal, which we're in the process of acquiring. Um, it just it doesn't seem to make sense, you know. And, and you you said it. National trends talk about it's better and cheaper to renovate than it is to build new, um, and especially at $140 a square foot. That's insane money that you can't touch anywhere. It doesn't <coughs> make sense not to do it. Um, and my my whole time spent with the city of Lewiston between city council and the planning board, I've listened to nothing but 
we need to protect Lewis and we need to protect what's been here. There's nothing more quintessentially Lewiston than Bates Mill 5. It makes absolutely no sense to tear it down. And one, one quick point, because uh, I know it was said the last time I was here, the Chinese development in Auburn, it's still boarded up when it's not going to move forward. And I know everybody chuckles because they're like, ah, the Chinese money was never going to come through. They thought about it enough that they moved forward with it, and it didn't pan out. Nobody wants to tear down Bates Mill 5 because nobody, nobody's going to come in and try to develop that land. They want a building that's there. And, and like Tom said, they want to do it now. They don't want to build it. They don't want to have to wait. They need it now. You know, that's why there's candy bars at the checkout island because everybody, oh, hey, I'm hungry. Let me get it right now. Um, so I, I, I trust in Tom. Um, I, I would actually like to see us do something with the property, um, dress it up. I think it needs um, some art. I think it needs some lights. Um, you know, if everybody says the building's ugly, I don't think it is. But let's make it not ugly. And, I, and I, I think it can be done pretty easily. So, thank you. And to that end, I will say, and I, I, I can't really share all the details of it right now, but I am working with an artist out of New York who is working with uh, about 10 other artists who would like to have a sculpture walk, a nationally acclaimed sculpture walk that would go through the Bates Mill complex into downtown Lewiston and, and really draw people into this area. And he actually has a sculptor for a, a massive sculpture in front of Bates Mill Number 5, ready to go. And something we'd probably talk to you guys in, in a private session to talk about the land and how it could work. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what uh, Zach, uh, Councillor Pettengill, said. Um, and, you know, totally agree with uh, Mr. Platts and his, you know, some of his points with respect to what sense does it make to tear it down. Also wanted to point out, um, you know, as a planning director when we were, you know, doing the Bates Mill originally, and I think one of the most significant um, encouragements that we had was some of the before and after pictures of Lowell, Massachusetts, in their renovation of, of their mill space. And of course, there became a national park and a lot of other things. Uh, but again, some of those before and after pictures that you showed, I mean, what you can do um, uh, with, with a, a structure that has some decent bones and uh, uh, historic nature. And I, I agree with um, uh, Councilor Pattengill as well. And, and um, Lincoln, you said something about where people were enslaved, but they were also able to earn a living and you support their families and do a lot of things. I, I think that there were some downsides to those. There was child labor at one time as well. Um, so there's some things of our history we're not so proud of. But again, I think uh, um, I remember somebody coming back to the Bates Mill who had worked there 30 years and visited the brewery, you know, and said, I'm glad to see they're manufacturing things in the, in the Bates Mill again. So uh, I, I do think we can talk about manufacturing as well. Um, if there's still a possibility of that, uh, I think that uh, the uses are uh, up to our own creativity and, and uh, encourages us to, um, you know, take a look at, you know, maybe this agreement, maybe it needs to be a little longer. I don't have a problem with extending it. Um, you know, the concern is, 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 will the developer come in and, and want to take that space? I don't, I don't want to hold that up either. And Tom, you've mm -hmm. expressed that, it, you know, uh, maybe that can be worked into the agreement too. Um, but I, you know, rather than kicking the can down every every year, I think we have to look at a longer term uh, that's more reasonable, and maybe even two years isn't enough. But um, with the caveat to say, if someone else is interested and is willing to, you know, put up the money to, to do a development, then perhaps we need to, you know, take a look at the agreement as well. But uh, I encourage you, and I thank you for your work. You know, uh, over the years, I think you've been a, a great community member. Um, and you know, the employment opportunities, we're not quite up to the 5,000 yet, but, uh, uh, you know, soon come as we, you know, that, that's a large space there. That's 360,000 square feet. And, 
it's mind-boggling in some cases. Sometimes I think bigger than the Auburn Mall, isn't it? Or yeah, is oh, yeah. It? The Auburn Mall, I believe, is 275. Yeah. So it's, it's again, it's talking about scale, um, talking about the ability of, of creating business opportunities here in our downtown, employment opportunities here in our downtown. And, and I think you're right. I mean, we've got the development occurring on Lisbon Street with 63 units of uh, uh, mixed age, mixed income housing. Uh, I think that uh, those economic engines are all part of this, this picture as well. Uh, you know, you got the Bates Mill 5 very close by, uh, and I think we can uh, use it as an economic development tool, as it has been in the history. And I think, you know, your, your, your history here and the history of the Bates Mill just uh, is encouraging me to say, let's stick to our guns, let's keep the building up. Let's, let's uh, go forward. And, and t you, you've sort of sparked something uh, that I wanted to finish with, Jim, is really um, the model we've yet used in our most recent conversations of let's go back to that same model instead of saying well, the city's not doing anything until there's a 200,000 square foot uh, of tenancy. That doesn't make sense. We've got work to be done. Tom's got some tenants who are ready to go and he could do it on a smaller scale. The entire mill would not get be done. The roof would be done. A portion of the exterior could have windows. Those type of improvements made, you would have some tenancy. The rest of the Bates Mill complex would also start filling up. So once Mill 1, which is the area by Baxter Brewing or Museum LA is currently, once that's full, Bates 5 is all that's left to start filling. And uh, we've looked at, uh, this is the TIF district that we had looked at originally. It was uh, simply, um, we were just cutting it off at Bates 5, which I'm hitting with the arrow. And as we started looking at it, there, you know, there's, there's oh, I'm not sure where that, there it goes. Uh, we're grabbing everything that's not developed in the rest of the mill complex and putting it in, in a tax increment financing district, if, if the council does it. I mean, that's, that's the proposal. So let's grab all of the value and use it to fund the improvements. Uh, Bates Mill itself, I think it is 20 to 33 million uh, of valuation at full build out uh, from what uh, Bill Healy has given us. And uh, it was nine to 18 million for the portion on the right side of the, uh, of the cross canal. So there, there's quite a bit of value that could be grabbed there, but it's going to take time. Part of uh, slowing this down and not going to 200,000 right out of the gate allows us to delay pulling the trigger on the parking garage as we've been negotiating these agreements. Uh, part of it was revisiting the Bates Mill sales agreement and what the city's obligated to do under parking. And uh, there's no triggers in there for utilization. I know some members of uh, the council and planning board have expressed concern that we've got all these parking garages and none of them are being utilized. Uh, the Chestnut Street, the Saunderville, and the Oak Street garage or all garages that we're talking that the agreement we've talked about would be before we would need to build another garage we'd be hitting 85 percent utilization in the existing garages that support the Bates Mill so there's there's a lot of work uh, legally that's been done but the deal has been changing so sort of the documents we've got in hand today don't fit the reality of, of uh, what we're looking at going forward so I think taking a couple of years here to extend the option, let Tom keep working it, and we can really craft an agreement that matches what's likely to occur. We've done about 20,000 square feet annually over the course of 20 years. Sometimes it's nothing for a couple of years, then you'll get an 80,000 square foot user, and then nothing in 10, so it's, but when you take the numbers and divide it by the number of years Tom's been at it, it's about 20,000 square feet a year. Um, so just a clarifying question to follow up on what um, Councilor Lyson was saying. Um, in terms of the way that the agreement is written now, um, Tom basically has first right of refusal. So that doesn't actually prevent another developer from coming in and saying they want to develop the site. He just has the option of saying whether or not he's going to pull the trigger at that point or whether he's going to back away and allow the second developer to come in. Yeah, it's actually not, an, it's not a first right of refusal. It's a straight up option. It's an option. It's an option, but, but but there's things that need to occur. He has to have. He can either choose to pull the trigger, or he can say, "No, I'm not ready to do that." And the other developer could. No, mm, that's not the way it's currently crafted. Okay, so can you just clarify that? Uh, the way it is currently crafted is is t Tom would uh, move forward, but one of the about really the only uh, governor on it is we would need to have the tax income financing and joint development agreement approved. And if uh, 
they are not approved. Tom could not exercise. I guess Tom could exercise the option if the city wanted to allow him to, but if there was no municipal support, if there was no parking, it's unlikely Tom would pull that trigger. It just to just be very simple. Under the current arrangement that's in place today, Tom has an option on the building. Right. So nobody else could come in and do anything with the building unless that option expires or unless uh, Tom says, okay, I'm done, I'm willing to, to waive my rights. And that, but that option expires in That like option expires at the end of this month. Right. right. So, so what Councilor Lyson was saying in terms of, of rewriting the agreement, where if, if another developer came in and wanted to, you know, develop it, we could write that into the next iteration, if that was agreeable to everyone? Like, is, is, is what Council of License suggested an option, I guess, is what I'm asking. I mean, I think we'd have to take a look at right. how it could be written. I mean, I'm, I'm not a real proponent of uh, rights of first refusal right. because they tie your hands in negotiation. Very few guys are going to negotiate with you for, a, you know, for, for six months and, and, you know, $20 million project and then find out at the end of it you can just turn around and say, well, do you want it? Right. It okay. just, it, they don't work. But I'm not saying that there isn't some component that we could try to figure out that would work. Okay. My question on that would be, if we were going to entertain other developers, potentially, would it be an appropriate time to put out another RFP, just to gauge any potential other interest in the project? Ed? <laughs> Certainly would be an option the council could consider if it wanted to. So one thing that I was hoping for clarification on, and I understand if you can't give a full timeline, but I mean, I was two years old in 92, so <laughs> just trying to figure this all out. Um, the asbestos and PCB, PCB contamination and lead paint, was that something that was addressed in the other portions of the mill? And what is the period of time, like an estimate of how long that would take? Uh, good question. It, it, all those issues were there as well as barrels of, my gosh, I wonder what's in there kind Great. of stuff. I mean, there was all, there was all sorts of uh, environmental work that's already been done in the rest of the complex, including Bates 5 okay. to a degree. Uh, asbestos is, uh, is up in the roof panels primarily. PCBs, uh, there's just one small portion in the, uh, right by the cross canal, there's a generating station, there's some PCBs just in the concrete there. Uh, I don't think the rest of the complex had PCBs that I'm aware of, that I, I recall. And lead, lead paint is, is, is ubiquitous and has been there. It's everywhere. Yeah, I mean, they, typically they sandblast it. Uh, and trying to reduce that cost, Tom has said, well, I, we don't necessarily need to sandblast all of it. There's portions that can just be scraped and painted. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you can't just leave it as it is. Okay, and the, uh, any estimated timeline on how long portions <laughs> of that would take for? Uh, it's a good, I do not know. Okay. I do not know. I would think, certainly I would think it could be completed within a year. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I could see where there's quite a commitment from Mr. Platts, especially in an investing uh, with potential uh, tenants, uh, $700,000. That's not a small piece of change to put out there. I know you can play the stock market and lose just as much money in no time. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is uh, there's what, potential. What, what day of the week is it? <laughs> we gained already. So. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I, I can see where uh, he as a builder uh, and having all the experience he's had, as well as others, I suppose, but Mr. Platt especially, uh, he has a vision that something can happen with that mill. And with that, uh, he looked at the potential investing money, which was, it looks like in the sum of seven hundred thousand um, dollars, that would be hard to lose, I would think. Uh, so I think the serious is, is there, uh, but I can also understand uh, Mr. Platt's way of thinking is that he has to do something with the buildings and mills that he owns already to put them on the market before he starts on something as major uh, as Mill Five. Am I wrong? Oh. Or could we do it at the same time? Yeah, actually we could. What we're finding is the kinds of tenants that are interested in Mill 5 
actually couldn't go in the other mills, okay. um, such as the University of Maine. Um, when we started talking to them, I'm thinking, you know, could they fit in one, could they fit in two? They can't, because those mills have eight foot spacing on their columns in one direction. Right. Mill five is the only one we have that has 30 foot column spacing. Uh, so it, it, it attracts different types of people. It's got higher ceilings, higher spacing, uh, much higher floor loads. Right. So actually we would do both at the same time. Okay. Very good. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. I, I just wanted to to go back to the option. My suggestion was was I, I don't know if it could be if you're if the year to year is really what you want. You know. Well, they have a little more time. Yeah. I, I mean, um, I don't want to tie it up to to you know hold up another developer. I guess that's that's the issue, and it, neither do you. No. But I don't know how that could be incorporated into the language. Um, but again. Um, my concern was not um, uh, having to deal with this issue every year if, in fact, uh, we have that kind of commitment and, and also that kind of support at the council to say we want to keep the building. I think that's the major issue. And we want to see what it can develop and what, what you know, similar to the rest of the mill. I had a question. This is a nine-acre space. Is that right? Am I reading what, it? When you include the rest of the mill complex, yeah. the, the mill itself is about four acres. The portion right by Main Street, it shows uh, one, two, three, four parcels. It's currently the green space between mm -hmm. Main Street. That's another acre or so, and then uh, the rest must be about four acres. You have to remember, as long as the option is assignable, I'm not going to hold up somebody who wants to do a I mean, to do a project on that site is a 50 to $70 million project. So if someone comes while we're still struggling, uh, I mean, I, we would assign it. I mean, we're not, we're not looking to, uh, if you think what we've been doing for the past 20 years, it's trying to put Lewiston on the map and put people to work and fill these mills. So if somebody else can do it, I'll step aside. We'll, we'll assign it to someone else. Uh, just just to piggyback off what Councilor Lyson said, I would fully support a longer option. Um, and at the same time, I wonder how much of our hesitation to fully commit to the project hinders people actually moving forward with the project because they're not going to get invested in it and then lose the opportunity to, to move into the space. So I, I think in getting the mill filled, having a longer option would go a long ways towards that. That's good to have. What, what I had recommended, and again, obviously it's council's purview, but uh, we've been on a one, just one year annually, just renewing it each year. Um, I had suggested three years as the time frame. So if you're comfortable with that, great. Um, if it's one or two, but uh, that's sort of the suggestion. And we, we do need to be back in front of you next week. Uh, the, this officially expires on the 28th. Uh, so we'd love to, to keep it current. So I guess looking for some inclination uh, if, if three years is sort of the uh, number that you're comfortable with or two years or just just trying to get some sense from the council are you looking to amend this current agreement or kind of blow it up and rewrite a new agreement around three years uh, instead of doing an extension maybe because I think a lot of moving parts have changed uh, possibly just kind of blow that up and do a brand new three-year agreement we can look at it based on this conversation uh, it'll likely be very similar but rather than just you know one sheet for new or new or new we can certainly do a th new three-year if that's what the council's preference would be so instead of an extension just do a brand new three-year agreement I'd support a three-year agreement a new one or an extension I mean I would need to know what the new one would look like okay I mean and we'll we'll be talking with Brandon Isaacson Council Marker. I'd like to see what the old one looked like so that I can compare it with the new one. Okay, I can see if it's it. a new one. Uh, there, I'm sorry? Uh, because in past years, each renewal came with a uh, conversation that this was going to be the last one, and this was going to be the last one. Well, if we're going to get into a three year uh, binding, I want to make sure that the, it's something different than we've had in the past. So I'd be an advocate for a new one. Okay. Understood. Now I can forward to you. I think eh, I can't remember if it was in the. It probably wasn't in the council pack. It was in a past council pack, and I'm not sure you would have gotten it. So I think we've seen it several times in the council, but 
being a new counselor, you probably have. Right. Um, just one other thing, if we're talking about the three-year um, possibility, um, I don't know if we'll have to talk about this in executive session, but I'm curious about the tax liability. Um, I believe Heather has told us about before. Uh, insurance. Insurance, insurance yes. yes. Insurance. Sorry. Insurance, yes. <laughs> Did my yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> well, that's it. Right, right now, there is not. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think which. Remember which insurance we've got on. Today. There's no no insurance on the building. No. Oh, Heather, well, Heather can oh, explain it. You got Heather. Uh oh. No. What happens when I try to speak for Heather? I get it wrong. There is general liability on the property, but not property insurance. So as long as we have an active option, the MMA has been somewhat flexible to us. If we show moving forward on the project, if we show some environmental work being done on the project, that will satisfy that moving forward project or uh, progress. If we just let the option ride and we leave it vacant but not move forward on demolition or any other option, that's when they tend to scratch their head a little bit. Is it possible to see a copy of, or get that outlined as well in here, just if we're thinking in a three year span of time rather than one year? Is that relevant or am I just? That's more of a discussion with MMA that I can have. Okay. It doesn't need to be included in the option. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so I will open it up for public comment. Anybody didn't expect me to <laughs> speak, raise your hand. Um, Robert Reed, 58 Albert Street. I've got a couple of comments based on what was said tonight <coughs> in my capacity as the finance chair for the city of Lewiston. And then I have some pre-prepared uh, remarks in general as a private citizen knowing the history. First of all, we assume this property, if redeveloped, would generate taxes for the city. But the University of Maine, CMMC, and the YMCA are all nonprofits. Do we really think they're going to go into a space where part of their rent will include property taxes when they could be elsewhere and not pay property tax? Something's not right here, folks. Secondly, I am deeply concerned by Mr. Jeffers' comments tonight as a city employee. He's showing an overwhelming bias towards one project. When he uses comments like he didn't particularly believe in the casino, when the majority of people in a non-binding referendum and during the voting in this community said yes to a casino, when he says people reluctantly decided to tear down a building, that's, that's a supposition. He doesn't know that to be a fact. He's assuming that or, or portraying that in his own words. It was a difficult decision to tear down a building, but it was a decision that was made. If Mr. Jeffers is making these comments, then I have to ask, is he looking out for the best interests of all possibilities for this project? I don't believe he is personally. As for my prepared comments, here we go again. To those new members of the City Council, I apologize that your time is again taken up annually by the white elephant, which we can't seem to shake. I apologize that each year some new incarnation of a business model is displayed to you for comment, get excited, and then languishes on the shelves only to be forgotten or dismissed when it fails. I apologize for reminding some counselors who year after year promise that this will be the last time for promises and extensions and then voting again to provide another year's option to buy, in this case, three years. I apologize to those who I represented in 2008 as a city councilor when we decided to tear down the building and got contracts at an extremely favorable rate, only to see a later council decide to spare the building and pay a substantial penalty to get out of that contract. Taxpayers wanted finality one way or the other. They still don't have it. I apologize to those who believe in historic preservation. While the building seems to be iconic locally, it's not even a footnote to those who designed it, but rather just another industrial mill designed to take advantage of the needs and surroundings. By the way, as to the walls of the canal being a problem if we tore down the building, I believe that same issue would exist if we redeveloped the building. I don't think those issues miraculously go away. 
I apologize to the developers who might have seen a large vacant lot with its amazing potential in our downtown as a viable location for a project, if only the building had been torn down. And I apologize to the current developer for questioning whether this will ever come to fruition, but the track record speaks for itself. I apologize to the building itself, for which we have been neglectful and not fully maintained it over the past 18 years, giving it less value, less desirability, and more cost to repair at some point. The day of reckoning is once again here, but will anyone on that council see it? If a developer truly believes there's a viable project to be had, sell the building to them out right now and be done with it. 20 years of spending for basic maintenance, some forms of insurance with no revenue coming in and a building that continues to decay is not what this city should be known for. Thank you. Any further? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, councilors. So, uh, Link had his um, uh, Link had his map up. I own some of the buildings in yellow. I know many of the other people who own buildings in yellow. Oh, thank you, Link. And um, and we can you just state your name and address? Oh, Rick? sorry, uh, Carl Shalene, seventeen Cherrywood Drive in Lewiston. And um, you know, I've talked to um, you know. Obviously, this comes up in conversation. I'm like, oh, what do you think about Mo Five? And there, I've never talked to a building owner or business downtown that doesn't want this. We all want this. We've all poured, you know, our lives into downtown and literally millions of dollars. And we would love to see Bates Mill 5 uh, come to fruition. And, um, yeah, and given enough time, I think it will. You know, I, I think it's great that a lot of people know some magic developer from New York but we have a great developer right here who will, given enough time, take this project all the way. His track record with the rest of the mill speaks to that. And um, yeah, I think it's important to, um, you know, to, uh, to let him have the option. You know, the, the only other competing option that's on the table here is to spend millions of dollars that the city doesn't have, and the end result will be a lot that public works will have to weed. And I just, I just don't think that that's a, um, you know, a smart decision going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, my name is Peter Rubens. I'm with Grow LA. Uh, I own the old Bait, uh, Bates building, uh, a building on 28 Bates Street where Taboo Hair Salon is. I've been restoring it since 1973. Uh, I have a business partner, and the two of us have invested in Lewiston, Auburn, uh, in a, restoring historic buildings. And as a member of Grow LA, we see this building as the center of the redevelopment in this area, also supporting basically uh, um, the access to the Great Falls, uh, bringing people downtown to see the waterfalls when it's flowing, possibly lighting the falls when the granite is showing, and the Museum in the Street History Trail, which will circumnavigate the Great Falls, come through Mill 5 in this area in the park, and bring people to downtown. So we really support Mill 5. Uh, we will continue to do that as long as we exist. And um, we really appreciate what uh, Tom Platts is doing by investing in one of these buildings that um, many others would not even look at. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, um, Mayor, Council, staff. Um, my name is Gabrielle Russell, and um, I live at 271 Park Street. Um, I'm a resident of Lewiston, and I'm one of the founders of Grow LA. We began in 2012, long before I joined Tom's team at Platts Associates. Some of Grow LA's core values are to promote a vision for our community, to celebrate and protect the unique assets that contribute to our sense of place, and to steward a healthy, sustainable community. As an all-volunteer organization, we worked day and night to put together a viable plan for Bates Mill 5 because we believe it is a gem in the heart of our downtown and it can become a regional destination. 
Redevelopment makes sense. I did not know Tom well then, and although we presented a great plan and tenant interest, it amazed me that a developer and architect of his caliber had interest in moving the project forward. I think back years before Grow LA began, and remember one summer when I was back from college and I was standing in downtown Auburn and saw one of the buildings in the Bates Mill complex renovated with new windows and all the lights on. It was a beautiful sight to see the large brick buildings so vibrant, which was something I had never seen before. For me, that moment was uplifting to realize that renewal was happening in the city around me. It gave me hope that it could and would spread throughout our communities and that many people could be a part of it and help shape it. Later, I realized it was Tom who had transformed these once empty buildings into a thriving downtown neighborhood full of people, art, performance, living, and gathering space. And he keeps working at it, although he does this work very quietly. I am personally so thankful that we have a developer like him who is from here and who cares deeply about Lewis and Auburn's future. I continue to be excited for the next steps in the development of Bates Mill Number 5. Please vote in favor of extending the option. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, Mr. Barrett. I'm Bruce Damon. Um, I'm the chair of the planning board, but I'm not here to speak representing the planning board. I'm here as an individual resident. Been here, grew up in Auburn, lived in Lewiston, good part of my life. I care very much about the city. Mill five, to me, is is a daunting um, challenge that is going to take many, many years to overcome the negative aspects of it. We've looked at a, a bunch of different companies or businesses that were in the mill originally. Many of them left because the mill didn't work. We've put one piece of mixed use housing in the mill, the lofts, and, what's, and that took only a portion of mill two. And what we've seen is that that developer has realized that more housing in the mill is not the best investment. He's now moving forward with the Hartley Block, which is here on Lisbon Street. He's also proposed that he's going to build an additional project on Troy Street in Auburn. No one has more experience with that particular portion of what's happened to the mill than he does, and he's moved off in a different direction. So I think that speaks volumes, that that mixed housing piece of it is not viable or not something that he's willing to pursue. We've seen, you know, that uh, there's a tremendous amount of mill one and a significant amount of mill two still vacant. And, I, and, and in Tom's defense, he ought to be fulfilling those. He already owns those. Those ought to be his focus. He needs to fill those. But Mill 5, that's a different story. When I drive back to Lewiston almost every night, I come across the Longley Bridge. I look at Mill 5, and you know what it says to me? Welcome to Detroit, the way things used to be. That's an... That's a, just, that's the past. Most of the buildings that were designed by that architect and that builder were in Detroit. They were industrial buildings. The vast majority of them have already been raised by the city of Detroit. When we talk about Lewiston not having money, let's not talk about Detroit. I think that, you know, if there's a new vision for the city, it has to start with that first view when you come over from Auburn. And that building, to me, is, it, it just speaks, it just overwhelms any sense of progress, modernity, or future. It's gonna cost a lot of money to knock it down, but in my mind, until it's gone, 
we're, we're stuck right where we are, and it's, you know, it's time that one of two things happens. Either we run another referendum to decide, let the people decide, up or down, put out an RFP to see if there's someone else that might be interested. I mean, when we look around the city, there's probably 150 or 200,000 square feet, and Tom could probably confirm this, left in Mill 1 and Mill 2. There's a million square feet left in the Continental and in the Hill to be developed. There's another property, a new property that will be coming to the city, the old steam plant in Island Point. Island Point is one of the signature places where our comp plan would like to see new development, this property there. This property at Beach Street, the old Pamco shoe building, that's a smaller project that would require less, um, more opportunity for smaller development in those buildings and those are signature properties as well. Mill 5, just because it is so massive, to me, I've been in it several times. When I'm in Mill 1 or Mill 2, there's, because of the wood, because of the, the size of the space, there's an ambiance that speaks to you that this would be a great space. You go in Mill 5, and what you have is a cold, hard cavern that is not inviting. And it was designed for a, for a function that no longer exists anywhere. It's an obsolete albatross. And until we admit it and make it go away, we're just going to be coming back around and back around and back around. And that's just me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of being the one that coined the phrase, that thing is but ugly. And I'll, take full, and I'll take full recognition that it was my words. Larry Gilbert said, you know, he said, you're that guy that called it. I'm still here. I'd like to see it gone. I think it's the only way the city moves forward. Thank you, Bruce. else? Okay, back to the council. Council Mark. I have a question for Link. Mark, mic, microphone. <coughs> question for Link. Um, earlier you mentioned something about, um, if I can find it here, there were two uh, casino and convention center. Uh, so yes. Did, uh, Those were the two proposals put out by the Bates 5 Task Force. Okay, and uh, you didn't make any mention of a 1998 referendum uh, with respect to that. And my memory may be a little foggy these days, but I believe that uh, when uh, there was an organization to, uh, to get the city out of the Bates Mill uh, properties altogether, there was another uh, group that fought that at referendum. And one of the compromises, I believe, if the memory serves me right, was that uh, a caveat that if there was ever a convention center planned for Mill 5, it would have to go to vote? It, it, correct. I mean, the, I read the referendum actually just before coming down, and it, first one was non-binding, second one was binding, and it was really crafted talking about should the city, should we get into the convention center business the way the vote worked out it was you, we, can, we would have to go to referendum if we were doing a convention center, but otherwise continue with what you're doing at Bates Mill. Because the convention center, I believe, was a topic of discussion shortly prior to and was motivating the um, effort to get out of the mill. And that, the compromise, as I understood it, was simply to earn votes. And it seems to, seemed to have worked because uh, staying in the mill, uh, for the city to stay uh, into investing into the mill, uh, that had to be put part, as part of the, uh, the referendum. I get it. I, I was not in town to live through that, so I don't know exactly how it played out. Um, I do know the convention center has been a concept early on for Bates 5. I think it really in the early 92, 93 planning that was put out as, as a problem. So you, you, I know you're a, a political junkie and pretty much keep, keep tabs on a lot of stuff. So I, I will trust your, uh, 
your recollection, reading the referendum question, it, it said, if we're going to do a convention center in base five, it would need to go back to the public. But otherwise, hold the course, keep making the investments you've been doing, is the way I read it. Yeah, and I believe it was designed to earn votes, and it worked out that way. Okay, yeah. Because I was on the losing end. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just just as a, as a summary, there'll be something on the agenda next Tuesday to uh, give the council an opportunity to debate whether to ex to provide an option for a three-year period. And I anticipate there'll be some discussion around the potential for a, a, a third party coming in and assuming it's the option on the mill if they have a uh, committed development proposal. If we can find the language for that. Great. Thank you. All right. We're good. One other quick reminder. We have the regular meeting on Tuesday, and we have the joint meeting with Auburn on Thursday. And it's a 6 right. o'clock start, right? 6 o'clock start. We'll have 5.30. We'll have a little kind of reception snacky thing. So we'll start at 5.30 with that. The meeting will start at 6 o'clock in this room. It's a hard time, but it's... Uh...